Hi there, my name is Gary Wood. I'm a principal speech and language therapist. And first of all, I would like to um, just thank the um, EDS Society for um, inviting me to this conference today. Um, and also I want to thank um, Dr. Alan Hakim uh, also for the invitation. Um, as a speech language therapist or in other countries as a speech language pathologist, um, I work specifically in the area of ENT, ear, nose and throat. So I'm going to concentrate specifically today on the areas in which I work. So I won't cover the full gamut of speech language therapy. In fact, I often joke that I have nothing to do with speech and I have nothing to do with language. I, I really work primarily with voice and swallowing, but ENT related. Now, I'm very much a new kid on the block when it comes to the EDS Society. However, I'm very much an old timer when it comes to ENT. I've been working 26 years at the, what was the Royal National Throat, Nose and Ear Hospital um, in London, which is now the Royal National Throat, Nose, sorry, the Royal National Ear, Nose and Throat um, and Eastman's Dental Hospital. I also work um, uh, in Harley Street privately. So first of all, um, declarations, I work full time for the NHS and I do have a private practice. However, I have no commercial organization that I'm involved with. Um, and so I have nothing to declare um, regarding this um, presentation. So what I want to focus on really is a little bit about the anatomy of voice and swallowing. So then I can link in to what complications people can have when they have hypermobility and EDS voice and swallowing related problems. And then we're going to go briefly on to some of the remediation approaches which I have found um, useful and talking to another colleague um, Angela Hunter who um, the society knows very well from a speech and language therapy perspective um, approaches that have been extremely useful and some of it is anecdotal because as of, like a lot of um, people are probably reporting that there's still not a huge amount of evidence um, so this again comes from a lot of experience working in the area of voice and swallowing and working with these patients and I'm going to go on to doing some case studies but not my complicated ones not the ones that are most difficult and often people would like to see at conferences as most interesting, but actually my common garden patients who come along with typical problems, which I see with people with hypermobility, so that you can kind of understand some of the common features that patients have. But first of all, there's got to be some anatomy. And I want you just to, first of all, just really focus on not necessarily the anatomical language here, but to notice that you've got the tongue base here, and then you've got the food pipe just at the back here, and you've got the wind pipe down here. And so a lot of people think that the voice box um, and the windpipe are either side of the food pipe, but in fact they are one in front of the other. And this is really important to appreciate when it comes to both voice and swallowing, because actually the area around the tongue and the voice box and the throat is basically what I would refer to Piccadilly Circus, but I'm sure in your own country you can come up with a similar analogy, where there is a huge amount going on. It's extremely um, complex system when it comes to swallowing and voice. In fact, you've got 27 pairs of muscles involved in your voice and speaking and over 50 pairs involved in swallowing. So it's a huge, huge um, complex um, organ that we have. And so the main things I want you to focus on is that the food pipe or the esophagus is directly behind and the windpipe is directly here. And in fact, with humans, and in fact, humans are the only mammal with a descended larynx. That's a larynx that has come down. All mammals actually have their voice boxes right close up, closer to their nasal port. Um, and if you think about actually with babies, babies can suckle and breathe at the same time. And this is because the larynx when we we're born is first of all up high, close to the nose. So actually then they can eat and drink and swallow and suckle um, much more safely than um, you and I when you become adults. So around about the ages of approximately three to six months old, the larynx will descend and come down. And then all of a sudden, it then becomes a complex um, system. So the larynx or the voice box is related, um, has, has lots of um, cartilages and bone, um, but also most importantly, from the point of view of, of hypermobility, muscle ligaments. And so therefore, as we all know that when there's muscle and ligament involved, there's going to be potential problems when it comes to hypermobility. 
And if you look at the cross section of the voice box, the main job for our voice box is first of all, and most importantly, is actually to breathe. It's important to breathe. And of course, that's gotta be the most important. So the vocal cords here will actually stay open as we are breathing. But the next is a guard, it's a safety um, mechanism. So what it will do is it will close to stop food and drink going down the wrong way. Or if you've got anything coming up from your stomach through the food pipe and coming up and over, it will close and stop things going down the wrong way. And then least important biologically, it's there for us for voice. Now, this is extremely complex slide. Sorry, coming on. Um, which talks about the layers of the vocal folds and they're actually a different layers so we've got a cover we've got a middle tissue bit and then we've got a muscle but i want to explain to you that the most important thing to appreciate about the vocal folds is they're a little bit like when you're baking we all like baking and most of all we all like to scrape out the bowl and we have one of these lovely devices and they're, they're created these spatulas so they're really soft and flexible right at the tip but they've got a firm quality to them right in the base and the vocal folds are made up in the same way that they're made to be extremely flexible at the edges so they can vibrate they are vibrating a good 120 times a second for the average male and 220 times a second for the average female and this will vary from um, coast to coast in different regions because there are some social ling linguistic factors to it but it's a fast amount of time top c is a thousand and forty eight times a second so there's got to be a lot of flexibility and so when you look at the structures the cover is very thin it's very supple it is a able to oscillate it's able to um, be very flexible but as we go deeper in don't worry about if they've got these kind of layers but they then starts to become more sturdy material. So elastic fibers are a little bit closer in. And then the closer you get to the um, deeper into the vocal fold, you then start to get collagen fibers. Well, again, that's one of those things that we all now know and understand that the effects that collagen have um, for um, hypermobility. So there's collagen involved at the vocal folds. Um, and then deeper in, you've got then that stiffer structure of the main muscle, which is a little bit like your spatula, the firm part that keeps it supported and stable. The other aspect about muscles of the vocal folds is just like all other muscles that we have got resistant muscles. We've got ones that give us stamina, but also ones that therefore will fatigue. And you've got also athletic muscles. You've got muscles which will give you a speed response. The vocal cords themselves are the second fastest muscle in the body. You've now got to work out what the first ones are. But the second fastest, they can move extremely quickly. As I said, 1,048 times a second, they vibrate to produce a top C if you're a singer. So there's got to have a lot of flexibility. They've got to have a lot of stamina, but they've got to be able to move quickly. And more importantly, if they remember they are guard, they protect you. They've got to move really quickly, quicker than food, quicker than liquid as it goes down because it's got to be able to stop and stop things from going down the wrong way. Now, the other thing to also appreciate, and I think you'll hear a little bit more from physiotherapists, etc., tomorrow, but muscles often work antagonistically. They work in pairs. They're muscles that pull in one direction and then pull in the other direction. And the larynx is, no, is um, also the same. The larynx um, is held just up here. And you've got the tongue base, which you can see in this here, um, which is a huge, huge muscle. And the tongue base, which you can see in this one here, it's a huge group of muscles that you'll have. And then you, those muscles would be pulling the voice box up. But it also acts a little bit like a suspension bridge. It holds and supports your whole um, windpipe in place, the whole voice box in place. And you, when you swallow, the tongue will move and it will pull up your voice box. And then you've got the other muscles, which will be pulling down. Now, interestingly, muscles only pull, they don't push because they have this antagonistic function. They will pull against each other, working together symbiotically. So let's come on to the voice. The voice here, you can see. 
are vibrating. You can see how fast. As you see the vocal folds when we go higher the vocal folds will stretch a little bit like a guitar string will stretch and as air is going through them just like I blow through my lips it's the action of the air that's making them vibrate and as they vibrate they produce the note now if I go into a higher note it's just the edge and remember I was saying earlier it is the edge that thin layer that epithelium which is the bit that vibrates but in the lower notes the lower notes is the whole mass of the vocal cord and you saw that in that video as the person was going up higher they would start to stretch and what was happening is the the edges were starting to vibrate more but they can move extremely quickly so again coming back as we look down the vocal cords are here and i want you again to appreciate the food pipe or the esophagus so we spell it with an o in the uk and most people will otherwise spell it with an e but O is the right way, es esophagus. Um, but what I want you to appreciate is down here is your food pipe. So what's down there is our stomach. And as we've already heard about some of the gastroenterological problems, the dysmotility, the weaknesses and the difficulties that people have um, with EDS and their swallowing um, and, their, and their reflux and indigestion. Um, that remember the voice box is a guard. So yes, it's protecting stuff going stopping it going down the wrong ways as you swallow but if anything comes up what will happen is what will happen is is that food will come up from here now this doesn't always have to be indigestion in the sense of traditional heartburn it can be enzymes and bile salts and other things can come up and irritate and often that's where people would pay, patients will come up with the <clears throat> that clear in the throat because he wants to protect he wants to guard he wants to stop and of course his natural defense is to tighten it wants to protect so when those sort of things are happening to you i want you to kind of think Thank you, thank you, Larynx, you're looking after me, because otherwise it'd be going down the wrong way. And some patients will complain of waking up in the middle of the night, coughing and choking, or worse, waking up not being able to breathe, because stuff has come up at night time and actually caused what's called a laryngospasm, where the vocal cords will close. So coming on to swallowing. Swallowing is a highly complex um, system that the vocal cords and the voice box and the larynx has to be involved in. And there are various phases to swallowing. You have the oral preparatory phase, which is um, getting the food into the mouth and got the oral phase itself, pharyngeal and esophageal phase. So let's go very briefly through those so we can understand that when things go wrong, what is happening. So the oral preparatory phase is basically trying to think about getting the food and putting it into the mouth. That chewing also, that chewing accent, and don't underestimate how chewing can affect us. Because of course we have these huge muscles at the side and some people will get fatigue and aches when they chew because we're using these muscles. And so some people will find certain foods more difficult or they would fatigue. And then there's the oral phase. When it's actually in the mouth, we've chewed it to the amount that we should be chewing it, and then we're ready to turn it into what's called a bolus, where we're pushing it to the back of the mouth, and we're starting to, put, and we're gonna push it down. It happens um, within, within less than one second. And I want you to appreciate that the whole swallow mechanism is a pump, it's a pump system. The tongue, remember I was saying, will rise, bring the voice box up, and the tongue will go back, and it's this pushing back of the tongue and this raising of the larynx which will then help to push the food down which we'll see in a minute in a short video and then there's the pharyngeal phase where the um, food is going back to the throat be pushed down the back of the throat and then pull it and it's going to be coming down the soft palate would rise to stop it from going through your nose and then the peristalsis is movement a little bit like when we see a snake eating that movement of food going down and then the vocal folds are closing tight stopping things from going down the wrong way and then the esophageal sphincter the valves will start to open to allow things to go down then we've got the esophageal phase the part where food is then starting to travel down into the stomach I want to show you just a short, short video just to demonstrate exactly what happens as we swallow.
muscles produces a wave-like movement called peristalsis. So you can see that action of the food going down, the muscles are involved um, trying to get that food down. So again, you can appreciate why um, some people do get what that called dysmotility, where the weakness of the muscle is going down. So dysphagia is the technical term when basically anybody can have difficulty in any one of those stages I've described, uh, and allowing food to potentially go down the wrong way or tip into the voice box or actually go into the lungs, which of course is um, quite a huge health risk for some people because you can get pneumonias and chest problems, etc. So swallowing is a really complex thing that needs to be worked with in a multidisciplinary team. So speech therapists, orthologists, sometimes dentists need to be involved when it comes to dysphagia. If you've got difficulties with the oral preparatory stage, um, dietitians regarding different types of food and making sure on nutrition. Sometimes you neurologists, because of course, if there's coordination of the muscles and nerves or there's effect of the nerves, and as um, we've heard um, already regarding gastroenterology, and of course pharmacists because some medicines can also cause some difficulties with swallowing but also some people need to have their medicines changed to maybe a liquid form instead of a tablet form um, so the pharmacist can be really useful in helping if you're finding difficulty getting tablets down um, one top tip will be actually put it into something like yogurt um, to help to let the um, well then drink lots of water because water will move much quicker than um, than yogurt will so as you put a tablet into yogurt it actually helps you to swallow a little bit easier um, but if you are finding tips, um, tips like that don't help then consult with your pharmacist regarding different medications and see if it's in a liquid form which you might find much easier. So you've already heard from Professor Martin Birchall, who I work with, and um, we've been working um, alongside um, uh, other members within UCLH, and there's a hypermobility unit there. Um, but over the last 11 years, I think we both agreed that we've seen such a huge increase in hypermobility um, patients and EDS patients coming to us. And obviously over the years, it's become much more widely recognized. And of course, for many years, it was not even recognized except for um, the work of Professor Rodney Graham and, and likes who've managed to really put um, the diagnosis and the understanding of hypermobility on the map and and now as clinicians we understand it um, the disorder much better we now have an indication of what we should be doing and the type of treatment um, that we can give these patients um, so we've already heard there are some common symptoms that we will often see um, from an ENT perspective people do having difficulty with their voice or having difficulties with breathing because of the feeling the airways closing or feeling the sensation of a lump is a very common one or choking. Um, but of course, there are general symptoms which EDS and hypermobility patients often will um, have. And these are um, highlighted um, in black the ones which pertain particularly for voice and swallowing because as I explained earlier we've got joints we have muscles involved in your larynx for voice and for swallowing and so therefore flexibility of joints we can get um, dislocations of the um, cartilages of the voice box um, we can also get pain or weakness of the muscles um, associated conditions which um, patients with EDS can often have is um, autoimmune thyroid disease, thyroid, if there's issues with thyroid, it can affect many parts of the body, but in fact voice is one where it can actually cause the voice to be a bit deeper. Um, if you've got um, too little or too much, um, you can obviously have um, various systemic problems with. So thyroid or hormones can affect the voice. Of course, depression, um, anxiety will affect voice, um, chira, uh, malformations. Um, there's a lot of nerves that come out from the base of skull and so nerve involvement is very common um, with patients with this who could therefore go on to have swollen issues. And we've already heard again regarding gastrointestinal issues and IBS. Um, and some patients will have this mast cell activation disorder or leaky guts also. Um, temporal mandibular joints, the joint of chewing, 
um, can often be dislocated or people will have difficulty or they have difficulty in the movement of or too much movement of the jaw. Of course, that comes back to the oral preparatory stage for swallowing. And then, of course, there is this response, um, reduced response to anaesthetics and, and pain medications. And obviously that can have limitations of what treatments we can have. If we've got pain sensations um, in the throat, we can often give medicines for that. But of course, if you have reduced response, then of course we have to start thinking a little bit more um, around what we can do for that. So the ENT's findings that we will commonly see um, that patients have with this kind of pain or fatigue, um, sometimes clicking as they're swallowing or just feeling um, uh, the difficulty in getting particular foods down as they swallow. We can get this prolapsing of the retinoids um, or we can see actually big movements of the vocal cords as well. Um, and then there's this high arch palate which is often seen with um, patients. Sometimes you'll get this the ENT or the speech therapist will feel around the voice box it'll all feel absolutely normal to them but actually it's quite painful to touch for the patient and so they have a very different um, pain reception and, and um, what is normal to uh, most people might be particularly tight or tender um, for you or for an EDS or hypermobile patient and then you get to see this um, extension of the inside muscles and the external muscles, the intrinsic, the extrinsic. So you get this moving your muscles more than you are meant to. So we know about obviously people with bendy arms and legs, but actually having your head to be able to go back more than it should um, will obviously hyperextend these muscles. But also the same thing happens inside with the vocal cords. Sometimes they can actually move much further apart than they should be because of this um, hyper mobile joint. And so the common things we'll get is feeling tired with both speaking and swallowing, um, pain in the neck, the throat spasms, the vocal fatigue, um, and then finding um, again sore throats or dislocations um, or clicking with swallowing. So remember I'll come back to work that muscles work antagonistically. I like to think of them like tents. We want them so that there's just enough tension in the guy ropes, that there's just enough pull on one side than the other to keep it stable. But it doesn't take much for things when you're hypermobile to be blown off proportion, to go off kilter where one side is pulling more than the other. And so I often think that being called hypermobile, actually you've got hypo and hypo. One side is pulling more than it should and another side is not doing as much as it should be. So part of what speech therapy is about is trying to get that just right. Getting that where the voice and the swallowing and the muscles are working just enough so that you're not pushing them too much or not pushing them, to, um, or pushing them enough. So speech therapy intervention is all about strengthening the voice strengthening the muscles in a similar way in which physios would be working on exercises to strengthen the muscles. Speech therapy can also give exercises to help strengthen, but also manual therapy, manipulation, working around or it guiding patients in ways in which they can stretch those muscles which are really tight. Um, and then there's the stabilizing the swallow. This can be simply by managing how much food we eat in the sense that if you find that trying to eat a regular normal evening meal um, is too much, maybe splitting it up so you don't fatigue. Remember I was saying about the fatigue muscles. So make sure you don't fatigue as you are swallowing. So the other thing is actually managing the expectations of your own ability. Every, every patient, from my experience, have different levels of um, issues. Um, just understanding and helping you to understand what your throat can do, what it should do, not what it can do. So the fact that your head can go back really far doesn't mean to say you should be putting your head far back because that can again, like the guy ropes, pull everything too much on one side and throw all the, um, the very fine tuned movements out of proportion. And so giving you the first case I've got um, is interestingly a junior ENT doctor. So a junior doctor looked and said no abnormality diagnosed. So it was normal, labs, everything was fine. This patient is just complaining of throat pain, symptom of speech therapy. They feel like they've got a lump in the throat. Um, actually, 
um, when I took a history, yes, they were saying about feeling of a lump in the throat. Those having excess phlegm, they feel the, their swallowing was very slow. They found bitty foods were getting tight, um, stuck in the throat and then had this soreness and dryness. Now, interestingly, she works as an interpreter, so she has to use a voice a large amount of time. She's what I would call a vocal athlete. She has to do many miles a day with her voice. And so when we um, look at her diagnosis, she actually has been diagnosed with a, a EDS, a classic form. She's got an array of normal kind of, of the symptoms that we would see with our patients. So gastrointestinal issues, got vasovagal syndromes, they've got the uh, flexible skin, she has um, anesthetic um, effects. She's got a lot of the kind of typical um, EDS kind of presentation. So what did I do? So first of all, simply, simply increasing your fluids. There's a lot of movement per second. You want to get good oil in the engine. If they're moving 200 times a second, she's got a high vocal load. You want to get good lubrication. So keeping your fluids up, steam inhalation also, breathing in through the nose, out through the mouth, getting that steam onto the vocal cords so you can hydrate it. Don't put anything in it. The rule is if you're happy to put it in your eyes, put it down your throat. And then the other thing is to actually help her to appreciate what is normal movement for her neck. She is one of those who can swing her head all the way around and bend her head right back. And she didn't even realize that that wasn't normal. And so just trying to show her and literally guide her, your head should only go back this far. Don't extend it any further than that. And then um, also then working with trying to relax some of those muscles in her throat. Um, that were tied. Um, helping her to stabilize some of her reflux symptoms that she had. She was using some alginates, but also she found that the um, herb marshmallow root was very effective for her. Um, then we utilized an exercise which is um, part of what's called a semi-occluded vocal tract exercise, a method called Laxvox, where it involves blowing bubbles into water. It sounds very juvenile, but it actually helps to stabilize the vocal, um, the throat, the vocal apparatus, keeping everything wide and open and stopping patients from pushing. So it was a really effective um, method for her. So, but obviously I wouldn't say just do that everybody, but um, be guided of what's best for you. But that was a particular good useful exercise that we found for her but also I was saying to her about spacing out when she's talking and when she's eating she does a lot of miles so all the time that she's not having to speak if she's moving from one um, client to another um, then see if she can have some downtime with her voice so she doesn't actually speak so try not to waste the miles that she can do and again with eating to try to reduce the amount of um, long periods of eating so maybe to eat less and often um, but also to be aware of her vocal load abilities what she can do the second lady I want to say the 46 year old lady she's wheelchair bound she used to be a dancer boxer um, and she was misdiagnosed I'm sure you hear that a lot misdiagnosed with MS um, she had lots of other um, issues she was told to strictly not to exercise and her mobility deteriorated and of course as I said if you don't exercise with these muscles the fast muscles go very quickly um, and so therefore you start to lose your athletic ability and so she had again a gamut of different um, multifaceted disorders related to her EDS, um, constipation, she had chronic pain throughout, um, she has uh, multiple spasms, um, but she came to me, what did I do? I got her to eat little and often. She had such difficulties eating normal sized meals. Um, she found that really hard but when she was chewing she found that so difficult as she was chewing so I said well maybe what we need to do is maybe just process your food a little bit more so you just help that oral preparatory stage so it's not saying blitz in the liquidizer but instead of having a great big solid cut it up a little bit more so you have a little bit of that chewing done for you so you don't over chew um, again, working with her anti-reflux protocol, getting on the medications correctly. So she was taking um, the proton pump inhibitors, which is a drug that's often used, must be taken before food, um, taking it um, before breakfast and taking it before the evening meal. And she was taking the alginate gamma kind of advanced, but I'm sure there's other types around, which is just helping to suppress things and stop it from coming up the wrong way. And just also helping her with the kind of types of foods which can cause more reflux. Um, symptoms. 
then it was working with trying to stabilize her laryngeal function again working with her with some vocal exercises helping her to um, with her volume she would often try to push her voice from here and I was trying to get her to resonate trying to get the voice up higher and actually she came back to me saying that she found that sporadically her voice was louder and easier than it's ever been before because she was putting less strain and teaching her to use the voice so that she put less effort in so speech therapists will help you to be able to use your voice much more efficiently and the last patient I want to um, tell you about is where a patient was diagnosed with what's called a postglottic chink which is a a gap in the vocal cords which is actually um, very common within women anyway because um, the vocal folds often don't meet totally with we've got a slightly breathier voice um, it will vary a lot from country to country but it's often over diagnosed and in fact when I looked myself because I run a speech therapy led voice clinic I was able to see that she didn't have a problematic jink she had these hypermobile originals, they would move widely apart. And so you would often say she had a croaky voice, a rough quality, it would break at times. So she sang at a church and she found her vocal stamina was really bad. Um, she often would talk about other dislocations um, and, and pain. She would have dislocations of a jaw when she was eating and drinking. And again, she had a multi-cluster of um, diagnoses attached to her EDS type 3 diagnosis, which she got back in 2012. Um, unfortunately, she had some um, so, um, surgery for her jaw um, before the diagnosis, and now actually she has got some misalignment as a result. But the treatment I had, again, eating little and often is such a good thing if you're finding um, chewing difficult. Um, so she had that um, helping her with her reflux that she would get a lot of stuff coming up at night time so just inclining the bed something like um, a brick or a, um, a book just underneath the legs of the bed um, so your stomach is up on an incline just to help stop things from coming up um, again was work on some exercises with the voice to help rebalance the vocal tract to help stop her from extending I'm helping her and we actually did some manual therapy some relaxation muscle um, work and actually got her to do some self manipulation again guided so it's not something that you just go on and do but you need to be showed how to do the manipulation just to help get rid of the tension yourself so some general tips just to finish with is that um, if you have some difficulties it's understanding your limitations and your abilities there is no cure we know that but it's about understanding what you are able to do and what you should be able to do, not what you necessarily can do so sometimes overextending is not good um, it's about understanding what you should be able to do and guidance with that is useful um, so helping him to strengthen and relax those muscles. Remember I was saying about the guy reps to the chin, trying to get that balance, get it just right. A little bit like Goldilocks and the Three Bears, so we're getting it just right. Um, and then swallowing, eating little and often, really good useful tip to do. Process the food maybe, control your reflux and really get that under control because that is really often linked to those swallowing difficulties. Um, because it's in constant guard mode and we want to stop it from guarding so it can release a bit more. And then with the voice, giving yourself some downtime now and again, give yourself vocal naps. Rest is not good because what you want to do is you want to exercise the muscles, um, but you don't want to over exercise. So giving yourself some um, naps for the voice is good, but also use the voice, get in that balance. Avoid any extremities. I'm sure you told this about other parts in which we use, trying to not push too hard. Same thing, so screaming and shouting, actually whispering something sometimes can be just as bad because when we whisper, we, we tighten. So making sure that you're not overextending your, your voice. And then to have some training to help support your voice um, so that you're not forcing or straining it. You're using it as efficiently as possible. So the take home message. Voice and swallowing issues do occur with people with hypermobility. It is under um, diagnosed, often is overlooked and often understated for patients. Um, often there are much more complicated or much more difficult or much more life-threatening um, things that are happening to you um, if you have EDS or hypermobile um, syndrome. But voice and swallowing issues do occur. Seek ENT and speech therapy or speech pathology advice. Um, somebody who knows about EDS um, and hypermobility. And I want to leave the parting message with life 
or living with hypermobility disorders. So it's a little bit like Goldilocks and the Three Bears, if you know what I mean. Some days are too big, some days are much too small. But today was one of those rare days that was just right. And what you want to do is just keep that just right with your swallowing and your voice. Thank you.